So I'm Carl Bass, and we're in my workshop. And then I can show you the evolution of making baseball bats. All, as the kids grow up through Little League, they hit a place where they start using wooden bats. And so we've made, we've made a collection of wooden bats. One of the things that I'm finding interesting nowadays is this mix between traditional tools and much more contemporary and generally computer control tools. You know, this five, almost six axis beast. What's interesting is making one of these is fun. Making four of these is almost fun. Making 12 of them is not. And that's the interesting thing about this machine is you start spending your time in other places. It can cut something in a matter of seconds that would take hours to do. On the other hand, I have the kind of problems I never had before. I mean, I never talked about debugging my chisel, yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Okay, so I was just going to talk a little bit about maker movement. I, I didn't know you were going to even show that video, but uh, um, I've been making things almost my whole life. Um, I've been making things before I even knew there was a maker's movement. Um, let me just try to develop a little street cred here, show you, talk a little bit about the things I made, and then, and then transition into what I think the forces are behind the maker movement. Like I said, it's a long tradition. I think it goes way back before we even called it a maker movement. I've been doing it for 35 or 40 years. I certainly learned from people who came before me, as I'm sure you all did. Um, when you look at making things, I've made things my whole life. I, I've built boats, sailboats, rowing boats. Um, I've built houses and buildings. I built rocket ships. Um, this came about with my kids. I built a, a little rocket ship. An interesting story behind this started. We turned one on the lathe, spent a day with my kid doing it, gets done with the day. He looks up and he says, Dad, this isn't what I wanted. I wanted one I could get into. Um, so we then spend weeks doing this. As many of you have built things understand, the thrill is really in the making. We made this. We probably spent, you know, uh, weekends for two or three months. The thrill of being in it, despite the fact that it has all these cool stuff uh, from avionics stolen, the, the LEDs light up with a binary counter, so my kids learned binary when they were that age, it was fun. The thrill of being in the thing lasted about two hours. Um, <laughs> and I think it's part of this bigger trend where you move from owning products to accessing experiences. And the one thing that I'm thrilled about, because they used it for two hours, it sat around for two years, and now at least is in the Chabot Space Center, where everybody gets their two hours of thrill, you know, of thrill so all the kids can get to it. Um, here, here's a bench I recently carved out of black granite. So I've made machines, I've made things out of stone, I've just been making things my whole life. Um, my professional life, I've made software. Um, and these days at work, what I basically do is I make software for people who make things. And so one of the things we do at Autodesk is we make software for people who design and engineer and build kind of the built environment, the infrastructure, the buildings, the things you see around in the built environment. It's also we make software for people who make the films we watch and the games we play, as well as all of the products around us. So that, that's what I do is I, I make software for makers, which for me is kind of the ideal job of combining making software with making things. Now I want to talk about what I think are two of the big trends going on and what, what's behind this idea and this move to digital fabrication. And the first thing is this idea that I call infinite computing. And the idea behind infinite computing is one you're all familiar with, but let me try to put a finer point on I think for all the years that we've been involved with computers, we've actually been thinking about it all wrong. We've treated computers as though they were a scarce and precious resource. You know, back to time sharing. We try to minimize the use. And if instead you do two things, you change your tool set and you change your mindset, where you think of it as infinite, lots of possibilities open that weren't there before. 
And I think we really have thought about this completely incorrectly. So as you all know, we all have some stat that basically says how powerful the computer in our pocket is. I was with an admiral from the Navy yesterday, and we were trying to guess at which point um, the iPhone had more computing power than the Strategic Air Command in what year? You know, than more computing power than all the computers in the United States. I mean, the amount of computing we have available today is unbelievable. And I think sometimes people underestimate these exponential growth curves and don't really understand what doubling really means. Now, the second thing about this idea of infinite computing is the price. And we all know about Moore's Law, but when you think about it, the only, the cheapest asset we have to deploy against the problem, and the only asset that we have that's going down in price over time, and going down predictably so, is computing. I mean, and when you really think about it, nowadays I can, I can go up and I can go rent a computer at Amazon for a nickel an hour. If I, if I compute the cost of my PC and, my process, and the electricity I use to run it at home, it probably costs me a little less than two cents an hour for a CPU hour, something like that. Compare that to what it costs to park my car in Berkeley, right? So to put 4,000 pounds of metal on a, on a piece of asphalt cost me about $8 an hour. Uh, getting a billion transistors to work on my behalf cost two cents. So, and I don't think we've really grasped the difference between those two things. And I think it's really important to realize that as you extrapolate this curve, you are going to get to the point where you have infinite computing. The other thing going on with the cloud is, you know, basically the scalability or the elasticity of the computing power that's available. So used to be I could have my one computer takes about 10,000 seconds. Let's say I have a problem takes three hours. It costs me about a dollar. Nowadays, I can do that same thing, but I can run it on 10,000 computers. It can take a second, and it still costs me a dollar. So there's this interesting, interesting transformation by having the flexibility to access this elastic resource. And the last part of infinite computing is the fact that it's ubiquitous. So while it's in our phones and it's in our tablets, it's also in our cars, it's going to be in our buildings, it's going to be on roads, and there's a possibility that it's going to be in our bodies as well. This is, this is where we're going with computing. And I think computing is fundamentally behind some of the differences that we're seeing in things like the maker movement. So let, let, let me transition from infinite computing and just, say, you know, and just remind you that we, we need to take advantage of this by changing both the mindset and the tool set. And what I mean by the mindset behind this is Used to be I try to preserve my resources. I never say I'm using too much Google today, right? You don't think, ooh, how, how do I, you know, I know how to preserve cell phone minutes. I, I know how to limit my bandwidth. But I don't say I'm using too much Google. It's just there and you use it. And when we switch in other arenas in the same way to saying I will use as much computing to better understand the kind of problems I want to solve, we will actually have made a big mental leap. Now, when we move to digital fabrication, which I think the interesting thing behind it is that we're applying computing to this new realm. And that's partially what's changing, what's going on. And the interesting thing about digital fabrication is that in some ways we're rewriting the fundamental economic rule of the Industrial Revolution. In the Industrial Revolution, it basically was in order to make things, of high quality, at low price, you had to make a lot of them. That's just the way it worked. What we're now able to do is we can make things in small quantities. Um, we can make it at very high quality. We, and we can make it at reasonable prices. Not quite low, but they're reasonable prices. And they're going down. And this fundamental rewrite of that economic equation is what's driving some of the ability. It's the fact that we can make things of a really high quality. So let me, maybe, there it goes. OK, so there's a lo lot of different kinds of manufacturing, digital manufacturing, personal fabrication going on. Um, 
There's a lot of attention being paid to the additive. I think some of the other interesting ones out there are certainly the more traditional subtractive technologies. The robotic assembly is going to become more important. And I think, you know, just as our generation was told about plastics, if I had one word to say to my kids, it would be biology. And I think the biological processes are going to be incredibly important as we look at digital fabrication. So one of the reasons why I think 3D printing and additive manufacturing, it's captured the imagination in a way like the replicator. It's the idea of moving this thing from one part of the world to the other and reproducing it. What I think has been interesting is that 3D printing is an overnight success that's taken more than 20 years to get there. I mean, the first 3D printer I saw has got to be 20 to 25 years ago in a warehouse down in LA. And now all of a sudden people are excited. What I think is really exciting about 3D printing is as we're able to lower the cost, do it faster, increase the build envelope, and change the variety of materials that are available to us. So nowadays we can print in rubber, um, we can print in plastic. This was interesting. This is a bowl that I just made. Um, it's a shape I did. It's, it's printed out of metal. So it's 3D printed out of metal, starts with stainless steel flakes. They're fused together with a binder and then infused with molten bronze. What was interesting about this form is I couldn't manufacture it. I couldn't make it any other way. So I tried doing it by hand. I tried milling it. I tried wire EDM. I tried a water jet. In the end, it, it, it was a shape I could only do, which leads to one of the interesting things about 3D printing, which is shape complexity comes for free. And I think that's a very interesting thing. My 3D printer couldn't give a shit whether it's printing a block or it's printing something complex like that. It just doesn't care. And, it, and in many of the cases, many of our digital tools have that capacity to either do something complicated or do the same thing over and over again. And as we've seen over time, one of the really powerful things about computers and um, is a little bit disappointing to me as a mathematician who likes the elegance of algorithms, is that brute force wins lots of times. And 3D printing is evidence of brute force just winning uh, despite all the odds. OK, what I think is interesting is the way people are pushing the boundaries of 3D printing. And so while I love what we can do as consumers, this is work going on at USC. I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but it's the 3D printing of buildings. Um, so what you, what you can see is the gantry um, in the middle. You can see a schematic on the left of model of the big gantry being built over the building. And that is the inkjet printer nozzle scaled up by about 100 times. That's actually putting down a form of concrete. The other one many of you heard of is printing biological stuff. Work going on at Wake Forest where they've printed a bladder. They've printed a human kidney. Uh, the idea of printing human organs <laughs> Well, I think the Star Trek thing is pretty cool. This is really cool. The idea that you can actually print human organs that function. Un unbelievable development. Now, digital fabrication is not only about what you, how you make things, but where you can make things. And so this is a, a, a colleague of mine recently went up in the Vomit Comet simulating uh, zero gravity. And they were doing 3D printing um, in zero gravity. The idea being whether you're out in space, deep under the sea, um, or in a remote village, what you can do is rather than bring, you know, rather than have an inventory of all the parts you might need, instead have the capacity to make the part that you actually need. And I think that's a big shift from the idea of having all the parts available. Now, like I said, I th what's going on is also this movement from owning products to as accessing experiences. And I think we're seeing it, Zipcar is an example of it. What you, you know, the reason why Borders has gone out of business and replaced by Netflix. What, what, what you, what, where you access your music. We're, we're all concerned about accessing the experience and less so about owning the product. I don't need to own a movie. I don't need to own a DVD. 
And in some cases, I don't need to own machine tools. Although you saw I'm a little spoiled in that regard. <laughs> um, and I think tech, tech Shop is a great example of this. Mark Hatch is here. I know he's going to be talking to you and telling you more about it, so I won't steal it. But I think this is incredible, giving access to everybody to the capacity and capabilities that are available with these tools. Now, like I said, where I think the most interesting thing is going on is in some of the ways what's going on in the biological space. Um, one, one good example is a company, Solazyme. There are several others like it, using biological processes to create fuel. So in this case, they're use, using algae to produce jet fuel. Really innovative. One of the limitations we have with some of the other technologies is that we're bound by space. You know, for example, 3D printing will always be bound by the fact that things go up as the cube. You know, you, you have this limitation. Biological processes go a long way to overcome the fundamental math of that. Here's another interesting thing. We're, we're, we're doing some work with, uh, this is the Wies Institute at Harvard. And what they're doing is building nanoscale robots. So what, what, it's a little bit bizarre to even talk about. What they're doing is they're using DNA strands. And they're using DNA not as information carriers, but as structural components. And as a structural component, what they're doing is DNA origami is the best way to think about it. Nowadays, you can mail order strands of DNA. You put them together. Depending on the strands that you put in the beaker, they will only combine in certain ways. And when they combine in those certain ways, they, they, they make these forms. Here, I'll... And so what they've done in this case is they've made a clamshell-like device. It has a hinge and a latch. And when it attaches to particular cells, it opens and releases a chemical payload. So the idea here is that you can either target cells, obviously, like cancer, or you can target ones and increase the function of certain cells for performance enhancement. So this is, this is what's fascinating. And I think this is what's going on in the world of making as well. The idea that you, know, you can mail order strands of DNA and uh, you, know, you, you think about this. We had erector sets. I did erector sets and Radio Shack. But kids now have wet labs. And what, uh, we just reproduced this experiment. It was first done at the iGEM competition at MIT. So this is where they take E. coli. You know, it's the stuff in our body that makes bodily stuff smell badly. And what they did is they, they, they took E. coli, replaced some instructions in it, replace some of, some of the uh, biological instructions, and instead of secreting the chemical that smells badly, they replaced it um, in a way that it secretes a chemical that smells like bananas. <laughs> so the idea is your sneakers, when your feet sweat, they can now smell like bananas or wintergreen or anything else you engineer it to do. So while I think our parents were freaked out at our chemistry sets, you know, and uh, the things we played with, there are teenagers going around who are re-engineering life forms, which is both incredibly exciting and incredibly scary when you just think about teenagers. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I think has also contributed to what's going on is the sharing of information. Having, done, having made things for a long time, it used to be that you could build something and not know about anyone else in the world who was building the same thing or interested in it for years, if ever. Nowadays, within 20 minutes, I can find other people around the world who are interested in talking to me about the crazy things I'm interested in building. And you know, it's this combination of community and access to information. Here's, a, here's one of the websites. Um, Autodesk now owns this. It's called Instructables. There's lots of them like it. If there's one thing I totally underestimated about communities in kind of the web 2.0 world was just the willingness of people to share information. You know, whether it's you know, the reputational capital or what's driving them, this unbelievable willingness to share information in ways that we can all stand 
you know, kind of on the shoulders of each other. I no longer have to derive everything from first principles. I can almost instantaneously know what's going on in the world, the state of knowledge in a particular area. And I've been amazed and delighted by how much people are willing to share. Now let me just transition to the last part in which I just wanted to talk about some of the stuff we're doing at Autodesk to try to help with the maker movement. So one of the things we do, we're really interested in STEM education. All of our software, all of our professional software is available for free for any students. And that's from you know, grade school all the way through university. But one of the things we've been doing is working on an entire line of software that's intended for consumers and hobbyists and makers. It's all available for free. And one of the first things we started with, because we thought it was really important to complete the cycle of going from physical to digital and then back to physical, was how do, how do you capture something that exists in the real world? So we have this product called 123D Catch. Um, here's an example. Here's Camille. I think Camille's here. Um, taking photographs of a shoe. So this is taking photographs of a sneaker. You can, she's using a handheld camera. You can do it on your phone. Uh, there's the sample of photos that were taken with it. So it looks like there's tw 20 photographs of that. Here's the 3D model that comes from that. There's the polygonal mesh that's formed. So this is just taking a handful of photographs, uploading them to the cloud, and reverse engineering, I mean, what's going on, it's reverse engineering the camera positions, and it's actually building a real 3D model. So just think of the possibilities. Anything you see that you want to understand, you can go grab with a bunch of photographs. We now do it with photographs. We're working on doing it with video so that you can go around, take your phone, take a video, extract the appropriate ones, and it will actually build a model. Here's another example. Here's a friend. Um, he looks a little mummy-like there. But, uh, and the mesh you actually see there has been reduced by about eh, two orders of magnitude. The accuracy of doing this with a handheld camera is in the hundredths of inches. So I can get a perfect reproduction of a 3D model of anything that I can get access to. Obviously, only the parts of it that you can see. But I can get an accuracy to a hundredth of an inch. So things called 123D catch, um, but what's blown me away is the things that people have actually done with it. So I am re originally thought it would be all about making stuff. What, what I've seen people do, there's music videos done with it, with performers, uh, huge amount of capture of archeological sites and historical artifacts, museums are using it. Um, there's just been this wild collection of things that people are doing. One I thought was particularly interesting, um, in Cambodia there was a statue of, the, of a Buddha that was destroyed, and they thought, oh, we'll never be able to capture this historic thing. Turns out the algorithm works regardless of whether the images are taken with different, photograph, with different cameras under different lighting conditions from different positions. So rather than having access to the physical thing, we were able to crowdsource a collection of photographs about the object, so you just go, we took a collection of tourist photos of it, and we were able to reconstruct a 3D model of the Buddha that no longer exists. <laughs> Another thing is, I think the 3D, you know, this idea of 3D modeling is incredibly important. I think too many of the 3D modeling tools are too difficult uh, for people who don't use them professionally and full time. We came out with a product called 123D that allows for solid modeling in a simpler, easier, easier to use. Again, available for free on Macs, on PCs, and, on, and online. One of the things we think is really important is to do this online so that you can access it. I got the five minute signal. Um, I'll go quickly. Another one for more artistic creation, 123D Sculpt. So it's, it's a version of digital clay. More organic shapes, more interesting free form. Uh, works well on tablets. It's perfect for using your fingers. How nice to have digital clay and have a digital device and an appropriate form factor to do that. And then the last one is 123D Make, which is, uh, this is work we did in collaboration with other lab in which uh, you t what you're able to do is take your 3D models, whether you sculpted it, whether you captured it, 
or whether you designed it from scratch and turned it into something that's fabricatable. So whether you can put it on a CNC router, a CNC mill, cut with a laser cutter, do whatever you want. And so let me just end. So this is a um, box that I made of my kid. So I made it with Willie. It's a, it started with a bunch of photographs of Willie. So I did one, two, 3D catch, turned it into a 3D model. It's actually, you can see there's a little line there. It's actually hinged, it has some magnets, it opens up on a pivot point. It's hollowed out, appropriately enough for a teenager. <laughs> and if you twist it, you have the ability to stick something in your kid's head. Um, and, uh, so we, we finished that. that, that's version one that we just finished. Willie stores all his little junk inside the hollowed out part of his head. Um, but to really you know, complete it for the maker movement, version two is just coming off the assembly line in which Willie decided that he didn't want people to go near it. So we took an Arduino, um, we hooked it up to it, and whenever there's uh, approaching movement or a loud sound, the eyeballs light up and flash with LEDs. <laughs> so. That, that's a practical application of the use of all the 1, 2, 3D technologies. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. There you go.